the cross bridge cycle. So what I've drawn here for you is one filament of myosin. And then in yellow is actin. And at rest, actin doesn't bind to myosin. And that's because troponin is in the way. Now, you may have heard of troponin because this protein is measured in, um, after someone suspected of having a heart attack. And you might wonder, why? Why is that? Well, we can think about it this way. If cardiac muscle is damaged, then the actin and myosin start to break down a little bit, and the troponin that is smaller than actin and sits on it is um, breaks free, and fragments of it can actually be released into the blood from the damaged cells. And then this protein will actually start to appear in the blood, which is abnormal. And there's a specific kind of troponin that is um, characteristic of cardiac muscle as opposed to skeletal muscle. So after a patient comes in and they want to see if heart muscle damage has occurred, one of the things they'll look for in the blood is troponin. Okay, so that's at rest. Actin is not bound to myosin because of troponin. But then depolarization releases calcium. from the SR, remember this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then that released calcium binds to uh, the troponin and the actin and allows, so here's the big key point here, calcium allows myosin to bind actin. So what allows myosin to bind actin? Calcium does. Calcium allows myosin to bind actin. Key take home idea. Okay, now meanwhile, myosin has been attached to a molecule called adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. And that ADP doesn't fit anymore when myosin goes to bind actin. So let's look at the second step. So here's the myosin again. And here's the actin. And once calcium is available and binds to troponin, then it kind of shifts the formation in such a way that myosin is able to bind to actin. And as myosin binds to actin, 3 is a crowd, and it forces the ADP off. ADP is ejected. And this happens as myosin binds to the actin. Three is a crowd. So ADP is ejected 
and I consider this sort of like a squid with jet propulsion. The ADP is ejected this way, which causes the myosin to do a power stroke this way. So the myosin does its power stroke. The power stroke moves the actin. So I'm going to put a little extra drawing down here. We'll come back to that in just a second, but I want to remind you of something. So if you think of, um, if you go back to the page where we looked at the sarcomeres, and you think about the actin like this. Let's see, so here's a Z-line with the actin, and a Z-line with the actin. And then myosin is right here. Oops, sorry, myosin is right here. Here are the myosin heads on the actin. Then after the power stroke, the actin has been shifted just a little bit closer than it was before the power stroke. So see how there's a space here, and then if we go back up here, you can see then that the actin got moved a little bit. And that is um, how the muscle could be shortened by isotonic contraction. And if the muscle is stretching at the same time, this could be an eccentric contraction where the power stroke helps keep the actin from ripping away of the muscle. Okay. So now we have a tired out myosin head. So this next picture shows myosin all spent and all worn out. See how it's all stretched out after the power stroke? So it can't move the actin anymore. Anybody could look at this and say, whoa, you've got to pull the myosin back this way again before it can move the actin again, right? It's pushed it as far as it can. But it's stuck, so it's not able to pull back and recock the head at this point. It's stuck. So in this picture, myosin, oops, I spelled myosin is stuck on actin until and then what we're looking for after that is ATP until ATP or adenosine triphosphate binds myosin so ATP is going to come in and bind, and then we see the next picture, ATP causes myosin to fall off of actin. So now three's a crowd again, but now the crowd is H actin, which gets left behind. So you can sort of see what myosin prefers to bind to. It's, it loves to bind to ATP and will leave actin behind to bind to ATP. But if it has to choose between actin and ADP, it's going to choose actin every time, and that generates the power stroke. So ATP causes myosin to fall off actin. Okay, so up here we had a key idea. Calcium allows myosin to bind actin. And then here, another key idea. ATP is the molecule that causes myosin to fall off actin. And that's going to be important if this is a continual cycle. If this is going to happen, this whole process is going to happen thousands of times in a typical muscle contraction. You've got to have a way to fall off and then, not surprisingly, you have to recock the myosin head, move it back this way so that it can bind to actin and move the actin a little bit more. So what causes the recocking is the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP. That's called the hydrolysis.
so then you can do the whole thing over again. So if you were going to have myosin and actin, and then I said, okay, well, what other ingredients do you really need? You would, should be able to know right away, well, you've got to have calcium, and you've got to have ATP. And sure enough, calcium availability is a key ingredient for how long and how powerfully you can contract, because the more calcium, the more myosin heads can be involved, and the more ATP, the longer you can keep doing the cycle. And that m might make you wonder a little bit about rigor mortis. So in rigor mortis, uh, shortly after someone dies, all of the myosin heads are stuck on actin, and they can't move because the body has finally run out of ATP. And then um, rigor mortis doesn't last forever, though, right? It might last a few hours, depending on how warm it is and that kind of thing. And then after a while, though, the myosin head, is the protein is literally breaking apart and no longer able to stay on actin, and so the body uh, loses that rigor that it has.